Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dev Pulse Con 2020, our first virtual conference. We are honored to host attendees from around the world this year. So I would like to personally welcome those of you who do not speak English as your primary language. So here goes. Please forgive me if I mispronounce things. Namaste, India. Assalamu alaikum to the Middle East, India, Singapore, and Malaysia. Welcome, Netherlands. Shalom, Israel. Hallo na karibu, Africa. Herzlich willkommen, Germany. Ni hao, China. Hola y buenos días, Mexico. And welcome to the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. And last but not the least, to my fellow North Americans from the USA and Canada, a very hearty and warm welcome. This is a very strange year, as you all know. We had to postpone our conference from the usual April timeline to October due to COVID. It has given us the time and the resources to bring together a fantastic lineup of keynote speakers, workshops on technical and product management topics, as well as panels on being the sole income earner and finding a path from engineering to product management. And to keep everyone from burning out from all the Zoom sessions and online meetings, we have streamlined two hour morning and afternoon sessions. All timings for our sessions for Dev Pulse Con are Pacific time. I wanted to take this opportunity to mention ThriveWise programs. We provide to companies as separate standalone programs. We have our innovative ally training for engineers and PMs, as well as our groundbreaking safe space program, which we are currently piloting at a prestigious Silicon Valley tech company in 2020 and 2021. Both of these new programs are in line with our mission to help improve workplace environments so that technical women can thrive in the workplace. So please do take a look at our programs on our website, thrive-wise.org, that is T-H-R-I-V-E-W-I-S-E dot O-R-G. And once again, welcome to DevPulseCon. So let's start off. The, the, the first thing I wanted to talk about, you know, everybody everybody saw this a couple of weeks ago and everybody just, you know, their jaws dropped, but uh, we've had so many jaw dropping moments that, you know. Uh, <laughs> Where do we begin, right? <laughs> so uh, let's let's ask, uh, you know, the quest question uh, about um, President Trump's order to stop diversity training in government institutions. So. Uh, I wanted to um, ask you what your thoughts were and specifically given this sort of an edict from somebody who is the president of the United States, um, what would your projections be short term and long term for something like this, you know, um, especially, yeah. you know especially given, you know, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's demise and you know, the ensuing turmoil that's going on right now for the for the Supreme Court, um, and you know this could easily be pushed back, you know, five decades, uh, you know, if we're not careful. So yeah, well, well, I mean, to be clear, he has um, waged a battle against diversity from the moment he set foot in the White House. So I think with this latest executive order. He's just underscoring the extent to which diversity is being attacked. I mean, this is a frontal assault on diversity. And um, it's not just federal agencies, it's also federal contractors. So he's threatening that 
if you do any kind of anti-bias training that you could, you know, lose your contract, you can't like it, you can't do it is, is basically what he's saying. Now, yes, that does mean that these training programs, I think it, it it's such, such a chilling threat that I, I, I would imagine that some would put the brakes on it, at least for a, t for a time to see like just how this will, <laughs> you know, affect. Um, Play out, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, and I have to say this, I would be far more concerned about this if I really thought that these training programs were having a positive impact on diversity. So part of the reason why I wrote my book, um, you know, the, the subtitle is The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business, is because for decades, many of the top companies and, and institutions have been devoting billions of dollars every year to diversity initiatives while the needle is not moving, barely moving, or in some cases is like we're going in the reverse direction <laughs> from progress. And so what I'm arguing is that instead of this um, investing more money in this multi-billion dollar apparatus that has failed to move the needle, these institutions need to look at more effective strategies to actually intervene in this pattern where there's no diversity of, of, for women and for people of color. And in my book, I paid sustained attention to racial diversity because that is where progress has stalled most um, since really since the 70s. Um, diversity, you know, despite a perception that we've made this monumental progress and part of that perception was fueled by the election of uh, Barack Obama as the first African-American president. If you look at the actual numbers of people of color in every influential field, they, are, they remain acutely underrepresented, even though people of color are about 40% of, of the US population, but no matter which field we're looking at, they are radically underrepresented in most of these fields. That's, that's uh, both encouraging and chilling at the same time. Uh, yeah. you know, um, so my, my next question is specifically, since we have a pretty technical audience, uh, so I'm gonna get a little specifics of chapter eight, page 184. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, in this particular section, you talk about, you know, the skills for the diversity, equity, and inclusion professionals that are typically hired by companies to run, you know, diversity programs. And I wanted to ask you what your thoughts and perspectives were on how, you know, given that you just mentioned, you know, uh, Things haven't moved forward at all. If anything, they've moved backwards. You know, how do you think um, companies and DEI professionals can improve the situations? Are are there any any thoughts that you could share that would um, that would give them uh, a direction that that they could investigate? Yeah. Well, as you know, because I know you read the book, because you cite these pages all the every time I speak to you. <laughs> You know, I, I devoted a chapter uh, to looking at how the Coca-Cola company moved the needle on, on racial diversity and gender diversity after a landmark uh, discrimination lawsuit settlement in 2000. And over five years with um, the oversight of a task force and with accountability from the, the you know, the CEO, they actually looked at the metrics across the company. They looked at women and African-Americans and Latinos and all of these groups. They looked at 
where where bias had metastasized in unequal pay and unequal promotions and unequal opportunity and, and, and unequal bonuses. And so they were able to actually see the patterns and then they were able to disrupt those patterns in real time. So before um, a, a, a job offer was finalized, they looked at the candidate pool. Was it a diverse candidate pool? They looked at the salary. Was it in line with other uh, people in the, that role? Because part of the lawsuit had found that even when African-Americans held the same positions as their white peers, they were paid less. They were given fewer opportunities for advancement. They were given more critical um, uh, work evaluations. So by looking at these patterns, they were able to actually change how they were doing their business. It's, it's, it's like opening the hood and seeing what's happening, you know, under, under the hood. Right. And so over a period of five years, they were able to actually um, include far more women and people of color and upper management. And, you know, they, 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 it's a system that they have continued to maintain. It's not perfect. Um, you know, the, you know, people are still underrepresented in certain roles, particularly in management, but, but they made f like far greater um, advancements than from where they had been. And so that is one model that can be replicated, but it's, it's pretty telling that a recent Russell Reynolds survey of Fortune 500 diversity professionals found that only 35% even had access to the metrics in their companies. So they can't even see where the problems are and what, what they need to fix. Without that, without being able to actually see where the problems are, you, you cannot even hope to, to fix those problems. So if you have 65% who don't have access to something that's really kind of basic to that job, then how, how can they do it? effectively. And, um, you know, many of them also reported that they don't have the support of, of the, the management, nor do they have the resources to effectively do their job. So that that's pretty illuminating and, and kind of indicates why we're still in this in this place where, you know, people of color are so uh, acutely underrepresented. Which, which is, you know, dive into the next question I had is that, you know, the, this is in the news as of uh, last week, you know, the Wells Fargo CEO uh, saying, uh, oh, there's, there's no, re you know, we don't have any uh, diverse uh, diversity in our company because there just yeah. aren't any diverse people. people. Right, right. <laughs> No diverse talent. There's no like. There's no black talent. <laughs> there's no like. That was so outrageous. I mean, of course, you know, we knew the apology was coming, but you know, that is part of what I write about in my book. You know, part of the problem with diversity initiatives is that we have such a big problem in the, in our society with these perceptions that are so deeply embedded. In, in the American DNA, you know, this perception of African uh, inferiority and European superiority that had always been stamped into the curriculum. It's been stamped into Hollywood, into film, into literature, into it's the air we breathe, this, this pernicious idea of racial superiority and racial inferiority. And so that is still something that we're living with. And, you know, what I'm saying is that this is not something that you can undo with a one hour or full day training <laughs> session. This is, this is a societal problem that requires a holistic approach, right? Beginning without, you know, curricula from kindergarten through, you know, postgraduate school, you know, you can graduate in this country with some of the highest degrees with a post post doc, and you still don't have to learn anything about the history of racial bias and the lingering consequences of earlier acts, how we're still living with the legacy 
of slavery, of colonialism, of all of these things. And until we begin to address that, which we're beginning to do now, like we're beginning to see Confederate statues topple, that I know. why were they still there? <laughs> you know, why were they there? Um, we're, we're just beginning to see some of the more offensive iconography come down. Aunt Jemima's being retired. Uncle Ben's being retired, you know, offensive names of, of sports teams are being retired. So at least today, um, there is this, this newfound recognition of the myriad ways that a, a very, very um, deeply embedded, um, you know, ethos needs to be addressed and it needs to be a societal reckoning because you can't look to one place for for that kind of ideology you know for the expression of that ideology it is truly the air we breathe and so you cannot hope to implant diversity initiatives into a toxic ecosystem and expect it to hold which is why Study after study, including a very um, influential study by Frank Dobbin out of Harvard, found that these, these, these um, anti-bias training, not only have they not been shown to work, and the numbers bear that out, really, yeah, yeah. but five years after mandatory training, the number and percentage of African-American women in management and and Asian men and women in management actually goes down. <laughs> so not only does it not help, <laughs> it is actually hurting the very cause because it triggers such resentment, yeah. particularly among white men. And anyone who's been through diversity training probably has seen <laughs> how, how that has, has occurred in the workplace. So why are companies continuing to do the exact same thing that has failed and expect different results? They have to change course because you'll have a company like Google that in a single year will invest $100 million in diversity initiatives, yet the needle, as we all know, That's barely true. moves year after year. Year after year, they, they, they come up with these um, disappointing reports. They always say how disappointing, but where's the intervention? Like, where is the change of course that would even give them the hope of having something other than a disappointing report? And, and there are models, as I say, there are, there, are, there are many models that can better advance this cause, but instead they keep going back to the tried and true failed. Failed that cost so much money, they cost so much angst, you know, uh, you know, a case in point of the backlash is what is President Trump's executive order. That's like exhibit A, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, exhibit B, we had the, the Google memo by, you know, a man who like pretty much unloaded on women and people of color who, who you know, are assumed to be less competent, you know. Um, so, we're not making any progress by, by those failed strategies. So we need to change the strategies. You know, that a hundred million a year could be better spent if Google really believes that it's a pipeline problem. And there, there's evidence that that may not even be the case if you, if you, if you broaden the network, the professional networks that you tap into, if you look more broadly at, you know, professional networks of color, you know, there, you know, there are quite a number of African Americans and Latinos who are get coming out of schools with engineering degrees, with computer science degrees, with, you know, but if they truly think it's a pipeline problem, take that hundred million, invest in the pipeline. <laughs> like do do something that can actually change the game. Don't continue to do what you already see doesn't work. It, like it's exasperating to me. And, and you know, this is, so this, this dovetails directly into the next thing that I was going to ask you in chapter eight, page 180. 
<laughs> this is where you were talking about the backlash for the DEI training. And so uh, I personally run into a lot of uh, questions, especially from, from men uh, on the technical ladder, even on the PM ladder where they are so frustrated, you know, they say, you know, I'm trying my best to, you know, include everybody. I am trying to do the best I can. First of all, I don't really know what to do because nobody's actually given me any guidance on what to do, but I'm trying to do whatever I can by Googling and reading articles and things like that. But I feel like I am walking on eggshells. Right. I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. I don't know if I'm doing the wrong thing. I don't know, you know, what I should do. So I'm just terrified, right? And this is the this is the the mindset that I'm seeing right now, at least you know, in the tech industry. So mm -hmm. men are just we want to improve this, but we have no idea how to do it because, like you mentioned, you know, the entire society is geared towards you know teaching us a particular mindset. <laughs> And these, you know, we come with those mindsets into companies. And right. so all employees have this, right? So can you share some some ideas, some thoughts on, you know, what you've seen that that could help, um, you know, employees who really want to make a difference, don't know what to do, and are feeling like, you know, abandoned and, you know, uh, walking on eggshells is, is yeah. a classic. Yeah. I have to believe that this is an honest feeling that people have because it's come up in so many talks that I've given within companies and institutions where people have actually said that, you know, I've worked here for five years and I've never talked to my African American colleagues because I don't know what to say. And like, I find that like to me, <laughs> to me, it's like, how about hello? How about how are you? How? But these are the, this is what I'm saying, that there's just such discomfort around people who are not the people they're accustomed to dealing with. And in some cases, like in tech, that would include women, right? Yeah. Um, the only way through this is A, by recognizing you are afraid of a fellow American. This is a, colleague this is not someone from mars right and i think you just have to overcome that like that's part like part of the problem is we don't have diversity because first of all we live in rigidly seg a rigidly segregated society so people often hire who they know and they hire who their friends know and they hire who they're comfortable with and they so people of color are often left out of that loop to begin with. And then you add to that women who are also seen as alien in certain spaces in science and tech, right? And engineering. And so you have that same, even though they know women, like unlike African-Americans, many, many white Americans don't really know African-Americans. Everyone should know a woman. <laughs> so, so, you know, People of goodwill have to overcome this, this idea that they are like, it, you're dealing with a Martian. You're dealing with a fellow American and a, and a colleague. And really the only way to truly address this is by having more diversity. Because I think when people are surrounded by difference, they develop a comfort level with difference. They see that, oh, you know, this person has kids just like me. This person's worried about like where their kids are going to school, just like me. Like this person is like, you, you get beyond the superficial and how people look and then you can get at who they are and you see that they're really not that different. But because we're so estranged based on segregation, you know, we live in segregated neighborhoods and we go to segregated schools and it just continues. And it's a self-replicating um, situation where these, these, these um, workplaces are replicating social spheres and professional networks. And it just, it's just like this endless loop. Yeah. The only way to break it is by intentionally breaking it. It's not going to just happen. You have to recognize that these homogenous 
spaces are a reflection of our homogenous social and professional networks. So now we have to make an effort to break that because we know it's not just, and we know that there's excellence in all colors and all genders and all um, you know, political persuasions and sexual orientation. Like that is something that if you truly are a person of goodwill, you know, unless you really do believe in, in, you know, that people are just inferior because of their race or their gender. I mean, that would, that's a harder thing to break. Like people need to work on that, <laughs> you know, because it's just a fact that it's not true. Like that's been proven time and again, that there is no superior race and it's all social it's all socially constructed right but other than that like people who just are clinging to something that's yeah. been disproven you know and they they may be the same people who don't believe covid is real they may be the same people who don't wear masks <laughs> they may be like i don't know like that is above my pay grade i don't know what to do with that but if you're truly of goodwill there are many strategies that you can begin to um, to to implement. Um, you you can you know figure out how to broaden the professional networks that you tap into. Um, you can you can figure out how to go even to the top schools and look for these organizations of color or of women um, in, in the fields that you need to recruit from. Who is being excluded? from these searches. I mean, it's, it's a vast field of people who are just being excluded just based on custom, like who we're accustomed to seeing in these spaces, who we're accustomed to reaching out and, and assuming excellence <laughs> from. Um, so that is, that is something in people's heads that they need to overcome. They just do because they're leaving a lot of talent out of the loop, talent that could help. You know, diversity, like study after study shows that not only could it increase innovation, but that innovation could also help increase the bottom line. And yet we're, we're just excluding people based on something so superficial yet so deeply embedded and the only way to overcome that is to intentionally overcome it. There's no other way. You have to be very intentional about it. And, and you know, just to add to your awesome points is it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, you know, it's not going to be easy as in you just do like a checklist approach. It's like, oh, check, check, check. I've done these three things. So I must be, you know, great at diversity. It's, it's, you know, breaking, like you said, breaking the, the societal mindset that all of us have um, right. and, and doing the uncomfortable things. And it's hard. Um, so right. I think it is harder for some than others. I, I think people of color have <laughs> always had to operate in two different yeah. spheres, right? You, you have comfort, sure. you know, just in your own, you know, yeah. racial ethnic group, and you have comfort in the larger society because- yeah you kind of have to, right? Um, so I think for many white Americans, they have not had to deal with people um, from, from different, different backgrounds, different worldviews, different, and, and, and that will be more of an adjustment, but it's not, you know, it, it would be a bigger adjustment if you're talking about people from another planet. These are people who <laughs> largely grew up with the same kind of traditions, the same, <laughs> watch the same television, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, so, it's not as far afield as people might think, but it, it's the lack of exposure yeah. that is creating the continuing cycle of exclusion. And the only way to break that is to intentionally break it and then as you do, you will see that it's not as difficult as, as uh, you, you initially thought. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for sharing this. So I wanted to um, see if we had any questions from the audience. So uh, Ben, 
uh, would you like to let us know if there are any questions from the audience? For yeah, uh, we, uh, we do have a, a question from the audience and I hope that uh, people will uh, submit others. So our question co comes from uh, Mercedes uh, Charmas and uh, her question is, since in most companies, one cannot discuss salary and benefits with others, how does one make, uh, how does one know if there was any discrimination in what was offered? It's very difficult. And that's part of the problem with, you know, when you don't have that kind of transparency, even if you, you are a chief diversity officer, you may not know um, how, how people fare along gender or racial lines, which is part of the reason why you do need more transparent metrics to be able to break through, um, you know, those patterns um, of bias that metastasize in, in unequal pay and unequal promotions. Um, you know, I think in, in the workplace, just as a worker, um, you, may, you may not know. You, and and that, that is what is allowing this this to, you know, this problem to continue, um, oftentimes you, you don't know, but sometimes you find out. And that is when, you know, you lean in and, and that kind of knowledge is, is power. But yeah, it, it does put people at a real disadvantage when they don't know. But with all of the lawsuits that have um, been successful, it's they somehow did find out. And once, once um, there is clear evidence of those kind of disparities, then the courts could like demand the kind of um, uh, assessment that, that happened in the case of Coca-Cola. Okay, so uh, thank you for that answer. So we have a second question that was submitted anonymously that, that's sort of the, the flip side of that. That one, uh, that previous one was about uh, how do we know whether it's happening at sort of a, a macro scale? This, this questioner asks, earlier in your career, if you faced rejection, how did you know whether to attribute it to a lack of experience or sexism or discrimination? Oh, that's a really hard one. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's really difficult. You know, the previous speaker kind of spoke to it. Um, you know, there are times when you just know because there's excellence in performance, excellence, all you like everything you're doing is like you're you're raising the bar and raising the bar. And then for some reason, if, if you're like, oh, I wonder what it could be <laughs> when, when it's the mm, I wonder because it's it's not performance. It's not that I come in late. It's not it's like, what is this? I've, I've improved the bottom line. I've done all these things like it's the process of elimination that may lead you to think that maybe this is gender, maybe this is race. Sometimes there are things said that are gendered or, or, or racially biased, um, but they're usually clues. Uh, and, and it's usually not one or two things. There, there it's more like a pattern. Um, once you detect those patterns, that is, that is when you have a, a better reason to believe that it might be due to something other than just you and your performance yeah thank you for that answer too uh so those are the questions that we have from the audience and i think we're also out of time so i'll turn it back to rupa yes we are definitely out of time uh but thank you so much pamela um it was it was wonderful to have you have you here and uh to have you share your thoughts with us uh on diversity and once again i would really highly recommend uh, everyone to to get Pamela's book. It's called Diversity Inc. Uh, we are raffling off two copies um, at you know if you attend our uh, recruiting networking as well as take uh, the daily surveys. Um, so please um, please do uh, feel free to attend those sessions. And thank you once again, Pamela. Thank you and congratulations on your conference. Good luck with the rest. Of the <laughs> thank <day>. you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye.